thanks. <laughs> um, so, so hi everyone. Um, I am going to be talking a little bit about um, Good Services, um, which is a book that I released this year. Um, and uh, the reason why uh, I wrote it was kind of really this, um, that kind of most services are terrible, uh, including Zoom. Um, <laughs> and they don't seem to be uh, kind of getting any better. You know, we, we sort of, there are some services in our lives that um, are genuinely enjoyable um, and kind of don't cause us uh, any pain or problems, but the vast majority, um, you know, still miss emails, uh, still have call center times that don't meet our actual kind of basic working day, um, don't confirm things when we've booked them, basic stuff that just doesn't actually happen, which, um, you know, is, is frustrating and adds this huge load to our lives. Luke, can um, I just I ask was... you a quick question? Could I ask yeah, you to it. turn your phone 90 degrees? Because it's coming as a... So you did, yeah. Do you know what's funny? What, that yeah, there, that's perfect. Yeah. It's funny when I said 90 degrees there, I was like, I don't actually know if it's 90 degrees. I've kind of made that up. But it wasn't, that's degrees, so that's good. 180. Yeah, <laughs> yeah whatever. Yeah, that's you cool. knew what I meant. Okay, fine. Good. But okay. I yeah. know what you mean. Okay, good. <laughs> Hopefully you can all see this. Right. Well, I'm going to need to hold this with one hand and then do that with you there, there we go that's better okay so um this is uh i want to tell you a little bit of a story about why bad service design is such a problem and why we really need to care about it uh, more than we do at the moment so this is Anne, um, and Anne uh, is a school teacher and she lives uh, just outside of Rochdale in New York and she teaches quite young kids. Um, so kids really between the kind of ages of five and seven. Um, she's a single mum and she's got three kids of her own. Um, and so she spends uh, a huge amount of time, not just at work, but also uh, doing three other jobs to try and kind of pay the bills. Um, Anne qualified as a teacher um, in 2001 um, and like most teachers she struggles to kind of pay the bills it's not a very well paid job in the US um, it uh, you get a, a salary of about £42,000 um, which for where Anne is living and for Anne's circumstances you can imagine doesn't really cover it as a single person um, she also owes uh, the US government about £77,000 in uh, $77,000 I should say in student loans um, not an unusual amount of money uh, but still an astronomical figure when you consider what that's for um, and like many people in her situation she can't afford to make the monthly payments uh, back to her loan. But the good news is that Anne is actually eligible for a government scheme that would mean that she didn't actually have to repay her loan. Um, but the condition on that is that she only gets to do that if she made 120 consecutive payments over 10 years. Um, and instead, Anne instead of essentially kind of being eligible for that scheme, Anne will now be repaying her loan back for the next 25 years. Um, and the reason why that is, is because of uh, this company. So it's a company called Navient. And Navient are one of the many uh, service providers that the US government uses to outsource um, its student loans. And I don't know if you can kind of see this fantastic uh, kind of um, statement they have on their website. Uh, we enhance the financial success of our customers by delivering innovative solutions and insights with compassion and a personalized service, uh, which means precisely absolutely nothing. Um, but aside from uh, Navient's terrible content design, um, they also have a uh, interesting but quite destructive uh, piece of uh, guidance uh, in the way they manage their calls. And Navian practice what they call a seven minute rule and the seven minute rule essentially says uh, that if you are receiving a phone call uh, and you're a call center operative at Navian um, you have to answer the phone and put the phone down to that customer within seven minutes or you don't get your bonus and as you can imagine people who work at Navian don't actually earn uh, an awful lot more um, and probably less than um, Anne does so they're really disincentivized to do that. Um, and so what happened was basically uh, when Anne tried to lower her payments so that she would continue to be eligible for the scheme, she was told to pause them because the only thing you can do uh, in seven minutes with a customer um, is to pause their payments, um, not to lower them because it's a much more complicated procedure. So that's what happened to Anne, which meant that rather than 120 consecutive payments over 10 years, Anne has actually made 83 consecutive payments over 19 years. Um, 
And really, the point I'm trying to make with this is that bad services ruin lives um, and in quite subtle ways that we don't even realize are to do with the design of a service, that they are the tiny little rules or the adjustments or the, the compromises or decisions that we make in our services every day that ultimately have a negative effect on our users. Um, and it's not just individual users we're harming. Um, in 2018, there was a record shortage of teachers in America. Um, and, you know, not just for this reason, but one of the major reasons for this was because teachers could not afford to do that job because of the amount of qualifications they need to get and the cost of those qualifications. And it's got so bad now to the extent that about 80% of Californian schools are now appointing unqualified teachers to teach in schools because they can't actually find enough qualified teachers. Um, 80% of the cost of UK government services, a UK government is spent on services as well. So this is not, you know, when we talk about the kind of the sort of scale of spending on services in the UK public sector, um, this is really the, the figure that we're talking about. And it's not really surprising. We are a service provider. Um, but what is more surprising um, is that about 60% of that cost is spent essentially on failure of our services. So people calling us up saying, where's my thing? How do I do a thing? And pieces of casework that essentially don't go straight through a process because those processes are really badly designed. Um, and a, a recent kind of uh, bit of investigation that I did about a year ago, um, about 53% of the calls to most government departments are to do with how, just how to do something. So how to, how to become a childminder, how to learn to drive, that kind of thing. Um, and when you think about the fact that about a third of UK GDP is spent on public services, really what that means is that bad service design is one of the biggest unnecessary costs to the UK taxpayer right now. And as you can imagine, I've spent a lot of my time um, in the various different things that I've done in government, um, talking to people about that stat and wondering why, do, why is this not hit the headlines? Why is this not a bigger issue? Why do people not talk about this as much as we talk about, you know, kind of bad spending on technology? Um, and, you know, asking myself why very many times. Um, and I think really the, the answer is that actually services are invisible to us. You know, they, they are the kind of spaces between things, the spaces between sort of booking an appointment and arriving or buying something and, you know, it turning up. They're, they're the bits between products. Uh, and so we don't really see them either as users or as companies who provide them. Uh, and it's kind of a little bit like this picture, you know, this, this guy here uh, sort of holding the... Um, the, the post office sign temporarily while this guy over here is kind of fixing it. Um, and, you know, in fact, rather than kind of conscious decision making and, and the kind of idea of services being designed consciously uh, in organizations, actually what design ends up being is almost accidental decisions that's based on, you know, kind of things like comp technology compromises or legal boundaries or political trends um, or personal taste. Um, and so, uh, this is kind of what most of our services look like now. Um, and this is a, a, a view of an in, inside of a, a kind of Ministry of Justice service. And you can get a, get a good look there. Um, and I challenge anyone who hasn't had about 10 years worth of training to understand how any of this works. Um, and, you know, this is the product of those sorts of uh, accidental decisions that mean that, you know, over time we, we end up with a service that, that ultimately doesn't work um, by accident. Oh, okay, I heard someone talking then. Um, so making an organization uh, user-centered is really, really hard. Um, like really, 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 really hard. Um, and you know, the kind of the spoiler to all of this is that actually the kind of the hardest part of getting your organization um, it, to kind of be user-centered is actually to realize it's a service provider in the first place. And I think that has to do with a kind of a thing that we're all missing, which is this sort of, sort of literacy around services. and you know, the kind of ability for us to be able to see services as things that can be designed, um, understand what makes a good service, uh, but also commit to designing them. Um, and without all of those three things, we're just sort of left in this position where we're just making these accidental decisions without consciously designing our services. Um, so I'm not going to talk about those other three, uh, the two things today, because uh, that would be here all day. But uh, I do want to talk about what makes a good service and why that's really important for us to talk about. Um, so when I started kind of having kind of thoughts about maybe defining what we mean by a good service, I got lots and lots of uh, kind of pushback from various different people, very sensible people that I spoke to who said, it depends, you know, it, you, 
you can't generalize and say that a dog grooming service is the same as a, a, a care service. And, you know, whilst that's true, there are certain things that, that kind of everyone needs from pretty much every service that, that we have access to. And they're really basic things like being able to find that service. You know, when you look for the internet, are you facing a, a pile of acronyms that you're not going to understand? Um, can you use it without already being an expert in how it works? Um, do you have to, you know, kind of sit there doing three hours of training in order to be able to use a service? Um, to be able to complete, to, to basically complete it from start to finish without any dead ends. So, you know, if you lose your phone and you've got two-factor authentication turned on, um, you know, can you still use the service? Um, and so, gosh, this doesn't work on, on kind of holding a camera. So, so basically what I ended up with was about 15 principles, in fact, 15 principles um, of what makes a good service. And you can see they are super high level very uncontentious things that pretty much every service should be able to do in order to meet uh, user needs. And, and I published this online and ended up with about 2000 comments, <laughs> as, as one does when one publishes stuff uh, on the internet and asks for people to, to give feedback and really amazing, amazing thoughts from people uh, across the world on what makes a good service. So this is the product of, of their work, um, of my work, um, and, and really just, I think, sort of is a foundation for um, the things that, that we all need from services that that are the basics not the the amazing things that will make your service kind of uh, beautiful and wonderful uh, for people to use um, so I'm going to talk about two of those uh, very quickly um, and that is you know the kind of two, two of the probably most fundamental of these principles and that is that a service should be easy to find and it should work in a way that's familiar so um, firstly, a service uh, should be easy to find. Um, this is kind of obvious, right? But um, not necessarily something we think of uh, often. Um, because if someone can't find your service, then they can't use it. That's kind of pretty basic. Um, and I just want to give you an example of, of this, really, and um, what this looks like in, in I suppose, UK public uh, service. So. Um, here is the uh, fishing rod license team. Um, they are uh, fantastic specimens of eyebrows. Um, this man has particularly fine ones. Um, but they, aside from having uh, excellent eyebrows, they run a service that um, helps essentially to pay for the uh, rivers and inland waterways uh, in the UK and the maintenance of those things uh, through the fishing rod license. So people who want to fish uh, have to pay to do it. Uh, and the service is a very old one. Um, it's actually one of the oldest services in the UK. Uh, uh, it dates back to Henry VIII. Uh, if you are so geeky as I am, you can go to the National Archives, uh, you know, when we're out of um, sort of uh, COVID-19 lockdown, um, and you can see uh, that the actual policy of the service is actually written on vellum. Um, so it's, it's one of the oldest uh, kind of pieces of service design that I know of. Um, and it dates back 267 years before the United States was the United States, just to give you a bit of context. That's just very old. Um, we have about 10,000 services in the UK government. Uh, we don't know how many because no one has ever counted them and no one has ever really kind of put them on a register, which is a, a topic for a whole other rant. Um, but this is a um, just a small selection of them. And you can kind of see, hopefully, uh, if you can read this, um, they are a collection of pretty incomprehensible uh, kind of acronyms acronyms, uh, names of things that you wouldn't necessarily know what they were. And certainly if you wanted to complete a, a kind of a thing like learning to drive or starting a business, you would have no idea where to start. And my favourite is still um, the sheep and cattle tracing service, which is called ARAMS. Um, so never let it be said that a civil, service, civil servant doesn't like a uh, pun. Um, yes, uh, I can share the PowerPoint afterwards and apologies, you can't see it. Um, uh, so the uh, what this does actually to kind of um, public services is quite profound, this kind of not being able to see and understand uh, what our services do. Um, so here you can kind of see on the top content on Gov.uk, this is the performance platform on Gov.uk right now, that um, over here in top content and the top searched uh, kind of services on Gov.uk is contact the DVLA, um, which sort of means that the eighth most popular service on Gov.uk is a phone number, which is not the bright, shiny uh, kind of um, uh, sort of service that we all imagined when we created uh, Gov.uk all those years ago. Um, and, you know, 
I'll say it's not really the fault of the people who have kind of put those services on Gov.uk. It's kind of the fault of how old they are um, and the fact that they weren't designed for the internet in the first place. Uh, most government services were designed for a world that looks like this, where essentially uh, you walk into your post office over here next to your slightly petrifying looking butchers and you said to the lady behind the desk um and it probably was a woman behind the desk uh, who said you know how do, how do i do something and that person would help you to fill in the form find the form send off the form um and would possibly even help you um when that thing uh, came back as well uh, and that is not how services work on the internet anymore services uh, work in a way that google is the home page for your service and people basically start looking for something and if they can't find it they'll try and call you and what we have in government is uh, what is colloquially termed a big pile of google fails where you don't know what you're looking for uh, and so you can't find it um, and really what this comes down to is the fact that kind of good services are verbs and bad services are nouns and i'll explain this um for the gr gr grammatically challenged, including myself, but basically what that means is a good service is kind of a thing doing words. They're sort of sentences like learn to drive, become a childminder, get a pension. They're not things like SORN or ch charity letter forwarding service or employer ownership pilot or names of things that we don't know what they are or what they do. They're kind of doing, the good services should be doing sentences. Um, and you know, cha changing the name of your service or changing the way that you describe it to be a verb can have a really, really profound effect and can be quite a simple thing to do. And it was one of the things that we did quite a lot on GovUK where um, we would take very, very simple services like registering your vehicles off the road, brackets, statutory off-road vehicle notification, um, and just rename them uh, so that people could find them. Um, and uh, including things like uh, taking those services and kind of putting them into chronological kind of order uh, so that there was a clear step by step guide uh, to help you to navigate things like learning to drive a car uh, rather than all of the different various kind of bits of policy and bits of transaction that were kind of littered over Gov UK. Um, and I won't play this video. Oh, it was going to play. Is it going to play anyway? Well, let's try it. Let's try it. I mean, Okay, Google, how do I learn to drive a car? Here's what I found on the web. When can I start learning? According to gov.uk, you can apply for a provisional driving license when you're 15 years and nine months old. You can start driving a car when you're 17. So there you go. Um, that was something that happened uh, entirely just because of the, of, of, relabeling and recategorizing that set of uh, services around learning to drive it wasn't a special kind of uh, alexa or, or google um kind of uh speech interface that we designed there was nothing special that we did it was literally just cataloged by google the next day because we had uh, made it readable by humans and turns out uh if you make something readable by humans you make something readable by machines as well so um that's the first principle. Uh, there's lots you can do to just make your service easier by helping people to understand how to find it in the first place. Uh, so the next one I want to talk about is actually um, something that is um, uh, a little bit um, more complex to think about but no less in important and that's making sure that your service works in a way that is familiar now in the public sector as i'm sure many of you know we're quite we're quite bad at doing this we, we sort of we quite like the idea that our services are really special and they work in a special way because they're government services so you know if someone books an appointment we don't send them an email because we're worried about them clicking on links things like that um so this is something we really, really need to think more about across many, many different services, actually. This idea that actually uh, people base their understandings of, of a service on the way that other services work in their lives in just the same way that they do of many other things. And we'll give you a, a kind of very quick and quite funny example of, of what that looks like in reality. And so this is... Um, this is the national rail uh, kind of logo identity um, it's a beautiful thing um, it was designed in the 1960s by an organization called design research unit and if you have uh, if you are a graphic designer or if you've been around graphic designers you will know that they get very very excited about this because it is a beautiful piece of graphic design uh, a kind of 
the sort of graphic design that's kind of been used the world over because it's so ubiquitous and we almost don't really think about this kind of uh, logo here as almost being a piece of graphic design because it, it's now so ubiquitous in our lives and you know when it was originally created um, the the design research unit had an amazingly kind of um, uh, bold aspiration around it. They wanted to kind of refactor public services, really rethink them. Um, and they went down to the level of detail of kind of really just, you know, sort of thinking about things um, uh, that were, you know, including um, the, uh, the kind of look and feel of, of the jackets and the, the clocks on the trains, all that sort of stuff. Um, but in reality, this is what people uh, now experience when they uh, experience a uh, UK train. And it's, you know, it's kind of classic thing that a lot of interaction designers show, but it's a really great example of terrible interaction design where uh, the toilet doors on UK trains um, are so complex that we not only need an instruction panel on the left hand side, but we also need uh, instructions above and below the buttons. Uh, and they have become uh, so uh, difficult uh, to use that we now have uh, YouTube videos. You can check a YouTube video on how to use a UK train toilet door. Um, and such a national joke uh, that they have been included uh, in Scotland's favourite um, uh, soft drink and iron brew advert uh, in the early 2000s, showing a man basically failing to lock the toilet door because it was so, so complicated. Um, and really what this comes down to is the fact that people base their understanding of services on previous experiences. Um, and that can make it really, really difficult to change your service. You know, if people uh, base their understanding and their experience, just like uh, the toilet door on how other previous toilet doors uh, work, then it's really, really difficult to do something different. Um, and, and I'm sure that the people who uh, designed the toilet doors on, on the UK trains really did genuinely think they were doing something kind of innovative um, and exciting uh, when they were doing it. Um, but, you know, no less uh, confusing because it's completely different to every other door uh, that you have ever encountered in your life. So uh, when it comes to changing and kind of uh, making your service better, you kind of not only need to think about uh, what the right thing is to do, but also what people will expect and what people understand and what they, they are used to. And it can be a hard negotiation between the two. Um, and I'll, I'll give you just one, one quick last example because I know we're kind of running out of time. Um, and it's an example of really what happened around the kind of um, a huge epidemic of skyjackings that happened in the 1970s in the US. Um, and it was such a, a an epidemic that between 1968 and 1972 there was about 130 skyjackings uh, and to the extent that in 1971 there were two skyjackings every day which is kind of astronomical really when you think about it uh, that that would not be completely unthinkable now. And really the two reasons why people mostly did this uh, was either to get money, it was quite a good way of kind of uh, extortion. Uh, you could hold a plane to ransom with, with very little effort, you just needed a gun, uh, which are relatively available. Um, and uh, or to, to go to Cuba because this was a, the kind of days of Fidel Castro and so there were a lot of people who were frustrated with uh, uh, the American um, kind of way of working and they wanted to, to go to a communist state uh, and they wanted money to do it. Um, so the reason for this uh, kind of sort of escalating in the way that it did is is partially because there was no security in airports at the time. This is kind of what air travel sort of looked like. You know, you, you kind of had this incredibly luxurious experience. And the US Aviation Authority really didn't want to change that because at the time air travel was just taking off, uh, literally. <laughs> um, and it wasn't something they wanted to disrupt. They wanted to make sure that it was a viable industry and they wanted to promote it and make sure that there were as few barriers as possible to people taking air travel. And so they thought to themselves, surely there must be an answer. Surely there's something that we can do to stop people from skyjacking our planes. Uh, and so some of the, the answers they came up with, uh, my favorite being, uh, I think, fl uh, flight mittens for passengers. So to basically stop them from holding a gun, which is a particularly good one. Um, or a fake Havana airport in Florida. Um, so that when people thought they were going to Havana, they actually landed in Florida and you could arrest them more easily. Um, so although these are particularly ingenious um, kind of ideas on how to solve this particular problem, um, they obviously didn't solve the problem. And so it wasn't until actually uh, later in 1972 that two people tried to uh, take a plane and fly it into Oak Ridge and nuclear power station that actually the US Aviation Authority took skyjacking really seriously. Uh, and they started to introduce um, 
at basic security measures in, in all airports. Uh, and it was a collaborative effort. Uh, US Aviation Authority got together with the aviation authorities in other countries and came up with the universal standards around uh, checking and security at airports. And the important thing about this story is that, you know, kind of security in just one airport would not have worked. Um, not only would it not be secure, um, but it also wouldn't be understandable to people. You know, you'd end up turning up at one airport, being checked for security, and then not in another airport. And that lack of ubiquity would stop people from really understanding how and why security worked and being able to use it properly. Um, and really, you know, kind of talks about this kind of, I think the moral from this is really that actually change both needs to be ubiquitous and intuitive at the same time. You know, you can't sort of be in a space where you're changing something and it's really intuitive in your service, but actually no one else is doing that in that way at all. It makes it really difficult for people to understand how your service works if it's totally different to everyone else's. And it has a sort of slightly different effect on how we think about then how we design our services. And, and really, rather than kind of keeping these kind of ideas and, and things to ourselves, it's much better for us and much better for our users if we share those ideas, if we share those ways of working. I mean, how many banks are now sending you automated uh, updates on your payments after Monzo have done it? Um, so that's the end of me talking. I hope there's some time for questions. Um, this is a very jazzy picture of good services. You can buy it uh, on Amazon or other independent bookstops as well. Um, there are some very jazzy posters also that I have printed uh, recently uh, with all of the very slogans. Uh, you can buy that on goodservices.shop. Uh, and thank you very much. These, this is how you contact me if you want to talk more about good services. So I'm gonna turn my camera around now Ooh. and say hi. Thanks. Thanks, Lou. It's amazing. Maddie had your book as a prop to show everyone. To show everyone. I love the typography <laughs> in the book. Typography. It's worth buying it for typography alone. The content is also pretty good. Um, we had loads of questions coming in. Siobhan, Maddie, Jane, Beth, did you did you spot any interesting ones from the chat that we can we can give to? Yeah, so there's. I'm gonna put the spotlight on Ab. Um, Ab hmm. had a question. Good idea. So Ab, do you want to? Ask your question to Lou, seeing as she's here in front of you. I, uh, yeah, which one are you thinking, Maddie? Because I, uh, I don't want to hog all the question time. <laughs> <laughs> the one that um, kind of intrigued me the most, I think, was the one around um, charities are, are assumed to need a degree of marketing and awareness to raise that they actually even exist. Mm. Yeah, um, so what did I write? Hi, Alu, thanks so much for your time today as well. Hi. And hi to everyone else. Uh, my name's Ab, I'm based here in Oxford. Um, so what did I write? I wrote, I love the sensible naming of services, makes so much sense, um, but it often feels that lots of charities um, and services that we have are also assumed to like sort of need a degree of kind of marketing or awareness raising around them that they actually exist um, as an option for people. Um, and sometimes maybe that will interfere with sensible naming or not. So we just love any reflections that you might have around, is that bullshit? Um, will people come to you anyway, if it's actually really, really tight or just kind of any good examples you've seen of people kind of managing that tension maybe quite well? Yeah, that's a really, really good question. And it's one that I think um, a lot of people in sort of who are designing particularly new services on, on new products or companies really think quite a lot about. And I think that the, the first thought I have is, is always just how ubiquitous and just how much of a sort of household name is your thing ever going to be? Because when people start new things, they always think they're going to be, they're going to be Airbnb, they're going to be Biro, they're going to be Hoover, they're going to be Sellotape. <laughs> you know, they're going to be a brand name that becomes so synonymous with the thing that people will think to look for their brand name. And in reality, that that's a really hard journey to get to. Uh, Airbnb spent a long time being completely unknown before they managed to get to be a thing that people knew and understood and so um, naming and understand and talking about your service in really clear language just as Airbnb have is just as important as having a, a really clear brand and a really clear message just because you call your name your the name of your thing Airbnb doesn't mean that you you don't then call the things that sit underneath it like you know Book, a, book somewhere to stay, uh, you know, kind of rent your place, those sorts of things, things that people can equally find and, and the, that search engines can equally kind of um, index. So 
I think it's always worth thinking about that thing as a bit of a journey of thinking, how do you get to the point where you can actually kind of rely on creating this kind of new name uh, that people recognize? And how do you get people to, to that kind of journey? But it's a really good question. Yeah, that was a great question. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you know what, you, what another thing that may actually be quite good to go and look at, Ab, is the, the content design session that we had. I think Maddie did a video and podcast of that one, isn't there? So like Sarah Richards from Content Design London, like echoing a lot of the stuff that Lou's talked about, about like so things like using job stories rather than user stories to explain services. And actually, I think making sure these aren't two separate worlds and you see like what you've described as like, I guess that fluff, that, that, that need some people feel that when you talk about marketing, you need to cloud everything in a massive, like I think you said bullshit, which is totally the best way of describing it. It's like, why don't we just describe what this service is and the difference it'll make to someone's lives and what the nuts and bolts of it are, rather than thinking we need to use giant fluffy words that actually have no meaning and no context whatsoever. Uh, so I thought it was a really good question. Any others that came in, Maddie or uh, Beth? Yeah, there's a... Uh, there's a couple more. So um, from Nikki, I, Nikki, do you want to ask a question around services as a verb? Mm. Nikki, are you there? Can we unmute you? Hi, can you hear me? Hey, there we go. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, I was juggling child at the same time. Um, yes, yeah, so it, it, it was just so more so thinking about when um, it makes perfect sense to describe services as verbs rather than nouns but sometimes I think we we think about nouns because we want to kind of lump everything into a box for a website and we're thinking kind of about the architecture of that um, and nouns tend to be shorter <laughs> and I was just thinking whether um, there's any thoughts on how to overcome that when you're thinking about website navigation. Yeah really really good question and that that's always the that's the difficult thing about calling things verbs because they're messy. Uh, and, and also the, the thing about verbs is that it kind of depends on, on your user's understanding. Uh, so some people will, if they say, for example, you're, you're running something that um, is used by professionals. Uh, so, you know, um, uh, I'm trying to think of good, a good example, uh, something like uh, kind of anything to do with buying a house. So uh, putting in a kind of uh, request to the land registry. That's something that some individuals do uh, themselves, but because it's often so complicated to do, they rely on a professional to do it. And that professional will know the name of your service and will go back to it and probably have it bookmarked and, and you know, be looking for a particular navigation on your website to be able to use it. And so there's always a balance of making sure that you, you can kind of serve both of those, those audiences. But the thing that I think is really important to think about is actually those noun structures reinforce the process that requires someone to actually get an expert in the first place to complete that service for them and actually is also if you look at a lot of the fraudulent government websites that are out there um, they are often kind of in an almost you can see a direct map of the the most complicated services to use with the ones where someone is offering to do it for you on your behalf for a small fee um, so I think that's always something to, to, to think about. Um, there is a way that you can you can kind of do both. Uh, and so actually the, the example that I showed of uh, statutory off-road vehicle notification or SORN in brackets with register your vehicle is off the road. Um, you can cater if, if without any changes to your navigation or your architecture by just simply naming the thing, the thing that people are looking to do. And then also making sure that you mention the name of the service. Um, and I think, um, there's also a thing to kind of think about in there about who you want to, to get to start using it more, who, who is going to put in more effort to find your service and who really needs help. And it is the people who aren't experts in your service. Um, but it's a hard thing to do because ultimately everyone in your organization calls it that thing and they've called it that thing for, you know, donkey's ears. Uh, and so it's a real, it's not just a, a sort of change to, to your website and to change to your digital service. It's also a deprogramming of specialist language and, and exclusive uh, ways of talking within your organization, which takes much, much longer to do, um, but is so, so important if you want to try and bridge that gap between users and people who, don't understand and don't talk to users, if that makes sense. Sorry, thank you, Lou. Okay, there was another one just came in, another question there. Oh, 
the, the joy of scrolling through a Zoom chat. Did you spot, did you spot there's another question that came in as Lou was chatting there yeah. and I didn't see it yet. There was one from, um, I think, is it Jackie? Jackie Malcolm, you were asking about user design for internal services. That's right, yeah, yeah. Jackie, where are you? Hi, hello, can you hear me? Yes, yeah. we can, Jackie. Yeah, hello. Um, so, yeah, I'm quite new to this, um, and I work in a public sector body, Creative Scotland, and we, we're kind of transitioning from, I guess, doing a lot of being introduced to user design with Open Change last year and now applying it through um, digital transformation. So I work in planning and I'm taking annual planning and strategic planning from basic kind of Excel spreadsheets um, into a web-based app, but also, also trying to kind of work, do open working and make planning again more of a verb rather than a kind of noun and engaging people right across the organization but it's not it's not for external engagement it's just a totally internal process and outputs and out and outcomes so i was wondering if um you know you think that actually the you know this is a very different kind of approach or whether the principles are the same mm. I think it's, it's interesting. It's actually quite related to uh, to the previous question about how how do you manage uh, that that kind of thing. And I think um, so. So again, it's a really similar question uh, to the one that I get asked quite a lot, which is you know kind of how do you manage the sort of verb verb noun thing for internal users versus external users. And mm. to some extent, people who are working inside an organisation um, will have a different way of talking and thinking about a thing than people who are members of the public who may use a service only once. So if you're using a service every day, then your capacity to be able to remember its name and to learn and to find it and to use it in that way is quite different. So, so you probably have a higher threshold in terms of kind of nouns, I suppose. But the, I guess the really crucial thing is how do people get to that point in the first place? So how do people become the expert in, in that noun? How do they learn what that thing is? How do they learn how to find it on the internet? Because no one arrives at a new organization knowing any of that language. It takes years sometimes to, to acquire it. And so there, I, I, I've never done any studies on this, but I think it would be really fascinating if anyone ever did, is the amount of time that we waste and the amount of money we waste as organisations onboarding new staff into yes. our services and practices <laughs> <laughs> because they're so incomprehensible and no one knows how to use them. So I just think that that is a bit that we always forget about because mostly we've got organisations where people have worked for us for a very long time. But that's also part of the problem, right? Because it takes them so long to learn all those things. They don't want to leave. Yes, <laughs> you know, absolutely. you end up being in an organization for 20 years because you, you, you've just literally got the hang of your services. Um, and it also breeds that kind of attitude where um, a bit like, you know, when a supermarket moves the milk, you know, if you make any changes or any improvement to your service, that person goes, well, I just learned how to use it. And now you're changing it. Yes, um, and so yeah, it kind of, it's a bit of a vicious cycle where you, you spend so much time getting used to and learning how to use a bad service that when you try and make something better and you try to change it and iterate it, it, it makes it more difficult for that person to to kind of hold on to their job because they they become an expert in that thing. So it's a it's a bad cycle all round, and I think it's one that is really worth kind of having that conversation about that beginning bit of the journey and saying like, how do people actually become experts in this first place? Mm, thank you. You're welcome. Right, thank you, Lou. That's great. There's a question there from Helen. This is one, I mean, that's been coming up a lot. And Maddie and I had a chat about this recently about can charities apply or buy this kind of independent expertise to help redesign a service? Most searches for this kind of support seem geared to the private sector. Cost is way out of budget. So there is no getting away from the fact that a lot of the bigger service design agencies can be quite expensive. Um, one of the discussions I had, so I did a talk on the Service Design Scotland kind of meet up the other day, and we we're talking, there was kind of fairly universal agreement among service designers, whether than the government or the agency side, that we need to, I guess, up the capacity in the sector. And I don't know what you think about that, Lou, just I guess that notion of not always having to buy an expert expensive support, but how do we mm. ensure that people are across the piece? can use service design to get their job done rather than it feeling like something that you just constantly outsource to other people. Yeah, it's a really, really good, good point. Um, 
and it, it's one that I've, I've obviously spent a long time thinking about um, when I was building the, the kind of central UK government design community. Um, we went from having 50 designers to, to kind of having a thousand when I left. And wow. um, it's that the thing with that is that it requires commitment and it requires mm -hmm. money and buy-in and those things can be really really difficult to do when mm -hmm. everyone else in your organization doesn't understand the problem with the service in the first place so you justifying the need to, to hire a designer just is so so difficult um but i think you know that there's a huge huge amount that that can be done to you know kind of upskill and to learn and to kind of get peer support i mean i've i've certainly been thinking about it a lot because i get this question quite a lot just purely because good services wasn't you know part it was partially designed for designers yes but mostly designed for people who work on services of any background to know and understand what makes a good service and not to have to spend you know kind of lots of money doing research that actually is just going to tell them the same things that they would have learned from asking someone else about what makes a good service and so you know kind of uh, books like good services are supposed to be a shortcut to doing that but um you know there are lots of resources out there um uh, I'm also thinking about starting doing some some quite uh, kind of entry level, um, uh, easy to access uh, training and support, and putting some videos out there as well. So um, it's it's good to know that that's a, a an ambition. But I would say that one of the things is just sort of um, taking advantage as well of, of stuff like this, right? You know, th this didn't used to happen. Um, you know, yesterday uh, talking at um, uh, San Francisco Design Week. I would never normally talk at San Francisco Design Week um, because it would take so much money to get someone over from the UK to do that. And, and now we're in this really amazing space where we can, in the middle of our days, just sort of drop into something that would normally be an evening event that, you know, those with childcare wouldn't be able to go to, you know, those, those who, you know, kind of didn't live in the space wouldn't be able to go to. So um, just, just keeping an eye on, on the fact that this sort of stuff is happening, I think is also really, really important. Sorry, that wasn't really a good answer, but I, you know, it's, it's a, it's a difficult one. And I really sympathize because service design is expensive and getting the money and the buy-in to put something out there to the industry is, is, is hard as well. Yeah. 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 And I think I mean, there's, there's, there's more and more good books coming out where I think people can borrow small interventions that they can try out. And I think, so one of the things that I spoke about on that, the service thing call that was on the other day was this, I guess, this danger of preciousness in design where I, I need to find the person who sent this tweet because I keep talking about their tweet and I can't remember who the person was, but talked about, we don't need more design thinking, we need more designers, which is fine. But if you're a small charity that barely has the budget to pay for any kind of digital support, or you don't, probably you've got a member of staff who's doing eight jobs, the idea that you're going to have a service design team is fairly ridiculous. And at the moment, yeah. it's the preserve of charities like Bernardo's and bigger organisations. And mm. I guess, how do we how do we ensure that that skill is across the piece from yeah. anyone who's developing services? And what does that look like? Yeah, and it's it's an interesting one because, you know, part of the reason why, why I built the, the government design community in the first place was because there was an unequal balance of money and buy-in in different departments. You know, your, your, your big areas like HMRC and DWP, they've got all the money in the world. They don't have all the money in the world, but they have money to be able to, to hire in designers. But actually the smaller areas and the, those kind of um, bits of government that, that maybe don't um, needed some people and needed some skills, needed training. So so we, we put together um, quite a, a kind of comprehensive training package for people who were in those departments to, to learn how to practice service design, how to do user research, how to do concept design um, and how to add that to their own skills. And I think there's there's kind of some people have talked about this before, but I think there's there's kind of scope in the charity sector kind of getting together to do a really similar thing for themselves of actually the bigger charities that do have the money actually kind of putting their time into supporting smaller charities and, and maybe, you know, kind of doing learning sessions and, and doing education kind of um, stuff like that to just support those areas um, and maybe donating some of their time I don't know but um, I think it's, it's worth thinking if anyone is sort of uh, thinking about that sort of stuff in the charity yeah. sector. Yeah that's good. Okay any we've probably got time for another one or two questions anyone else want to jump in? You can raise your hand you can either do it in person or you can do it virtually using the emoji thing. Very technical. Yeah, there was a good question from Christina asking about how best to involve users in service design. 
Um, she's specifically thinking about her start up, which is about mindfulness for preschoolers and wanting to involve parents and professionals in designing their service. Yes, I saw your tweet earlier and it looks like a fantastic service. Uh, I myself went to a massively hippie primary school and was taught how to meditate when I was about five, uh, which maybe has something to do with my life choices after that. So um, a re really interesting service. And I think, so there's no, there's no one answer of how to involve users uh, in, in design or in user research. I think the most important thing to always remember when you're, you're dealing with um, uh, kind of doing user research in that kind of small startup space is to firstly just not ask people what they want but observe what they need uh, and that maybe sounds really really trite um, but it is one of the most important things to any kind of understanding of what your users need and you can find that out from lots of different ways you don't have to to have conversations with them you can kind of skulk on forums where they're talking about their problems you can um, uh, read the things that they write in blogs you can you know kind of engage with different user forums in different ways um, but you know, the user research is one one powerful tool of doing that, of, of speaking directly to them. Um, there's also you know, kind of testing your service, so you know, kind of uh, giving them the service to to use, and then obviously testing that thing. Um, you know, kind of equally, there is uh, sort of bringing users together to help you to sort of uh, co-design your service as well, which I know um, there's probably many other speakers that have been on this um, this particular event who've talked about you know, kind of practices for for co-design as well, uh, and and you know the importance of doing that in a really ethical way, so that you know you're making sure that you're you're protecting your users uh, as you're doing it. Um, but there are a huge amount of people of ways involving uh, people, and particularly you know as as um, I would imagine a lot of people right now for your particular service are thinking a lot more about this. Uh, I know, you know, the parents that I know are really going through quite a tough time uh, because their kids are going through quite a tough time. So being able to reach out to those people and, and potentially offering them, uh, you know, kind of ways of, of supporting that whilst also kind of saying, look, you're also then contributing back and helping us to, to design this, I think would be a really good timing for, for thinking about something like this. Yeah, some really good points there. Lou. Any final questions before we, we wrap up? Tom Yule's not asked a question. This is weird. I don't know what's going on. It must be sleepy or something. I don't know. It's not right. It's not right. You okay, Tom? <laughs> good. Right, okay. I'm just checking. I've got, Sorry, sorry Ross. I'm just aware of the time. Just, I'm going to be completely self-indulgent, indulgently, and ask you a question. Yeah, yeah. Um, somebody had already, I can't remember who it was, had asked around services, and one of the challenges Ross and I tend to face when we work with our senior leaders is perhaps getting organisations to understand that they are a service. And that thing around, as you kind of said right at the start, and it's one of the biggest things in your book. Services have been around for hundreds and hundreds of years. And yeah. for us in the charity sector, people say, oh, we don't provide a service because they wouldn't do what they consider frontline service delivery. And Ross and I sit there going, but, you, but you're a service, you're providing something to people. So it's just around yeah. that cultural issue. And I think, I mean, I think you probably answered this already about language and culture, but it was just any kind of, you know, short, sharp posters we could have that say, yes, you are a service, damn you. <laughs> Um, there is actually a poster for that and uh, it's available yeah, on Good are. Services Shop. <laughs> um, but uh, I get, yeah, I mean, that is like the number one problem, right? And that, that is actually kind of another reason why I wrote the book is just to help people to understand that services are real tangible things and they should be designed. They shouldn't be accidental kind of products of just loads and loads of compromises that we're making. And the, the one thing that I think has really got through to people is helping them to understand and reframe what we mean by a service and actually treating that as a really important part of the, the service design process because I think we often skip over that and we assume everyone knows what we mean by a service and then people are sort of sat there going are you talking about customer services or like are we talking about funds are we you know like I, I don't work in customer services I don't understand what you're talking about and spending time with people just reframing services and saying look what do they mean to us what do we think services are um, you know, a, a service to a user is this and helping them to really empathize and understanding, understand that perspective um, and, and actually acknowledging that a user's understanding of what a service is, is totally different to their understanding of the service is this kind of like light mob moment where people go, 
oh, right, oh, A, users exist, B, they have a different understanding of our service than we do, C, those things don't match, oh, shit, we should probably do something about it. And it's, there's no one way of facilitating people's journey towards that. It's, it's a roundabout thing. But I think that just treating that moment of realization of what services are with respect and actually seeing that as a part of your process is, is actually a really important thing that I've, I've learned over the years. Brilliant. Maddie, do you have page 71 open that you can show? Yes, I do. Sorry, we were halfway through your father's answer. Somebody asked a question. I was like, that's actually the page I have open in Lou's book right Go on, now. Come let's see, let's see. Let's see. Um, was around, I think the question from, is it Barbara, was around how to manage expectations and actually what's realistic. So as a service, what you can actually do with what expectations are. And I think that's your page 71, which is principle number three, and looking at universal expectations, assumed expectations, and that, I th the thing that was new to me was the outlier expectations. So that whole thing around the, the much bigger picture of making sure that nothing is assumed and you really understand something. Mm. Um, so that was the, that was very fortuitous at that point. No, not gonna show us the page, are you, Maddie? Oh, sorry, yeah, sorry. sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> cool. <laughs> It's all, it's all asked. I, mean, I was just going to talk about it, but you can't. Oh, right. I was explaining it to be like a big, bold, like four well, words no, or something. Well, it is. Yeah. Principle three will be. If okay. I okay. Okay. <laughs> um, oh, there we go. There we go. Yeah, and that takes us back to the first question as well. Excellent. Look at that. As <laughs> if I meant that in some kind of like. <laughs> Always planned, Ross. Always planned. Really purposeful yeah. way. Yeah. Um, there was a, there was a, I guess a point came in just before we finish up as well about small charities and I think one of the things that it's worth talking about and I hope Blue would agree with me here because I think most service designers would work on this principle is this notion that charities have been doing service design for years you might not call it that but you most of you have been deliberately designing services in some way now you might be quite crap at it you might be taking outcomes and designing services using that approach but you're all designing services. And I think it's just, it's worth keeping that in mind. So we're not talking about throwing out everything that you've ever done. We're talking about giving you reliable, tangible models that can work regardless of who your staff team is. And this is one of the big issues with charities is you get an amazing member of staff who can help you design services. That person leaves and you're back to where you were five years ago. And it's how do we build those processes? And I don't know if you've got any thoughts on that, Lou, to finish up. Yeah, I, I, it's, a, it's a really, really good one. Um, I mean, I think uh, ultimately, I think the, the, the thing to realise is that services, A, services exist whether or not you've designed them. Yeah. <laughs> and design yeah. is really only the conscious process of change. And, you know, if, if you want to want to kind of see it in that way, actually, if unless you are consciously designing your services, you're accidentally designing them. Uh, and so do you want to just wander into to change and you want to accidentally make changes that may not work or do you want to consciously do those things and when you put it like that most people go well obviously I want to consciously design those things um, it's just the word design that really confuses people you know we've, we've been brought up to think that it means you know Philip Stark juices and pencil cases and, and it and it doesn't so sometimes just not talking about design can be really really helpful and talking about service change or, or whatever word you want to substitute with it it doesn't really matter it just matters what what you get done um, and, a, and a huge amount can be done I think by just doing the things that that are done by service design you know i think a lot of people the most common question mm -hmm. i get asked um is when do i get to call myself a service designer uh <laughs> and and, uh, and the answer is when you're designing a service <laughs> you know there's no there's no badge there's no club there's no you know i didn't study design um many of the people that i've i've worked with in the past also haven't done either it's something that you learn how to do either by formal training or by doing it on the job and sure you get better at it and sure there are skills involved in it but anyone can be involved in the design of, of services and if you're designing a service you're you're a service designer Brilliant. yeah let's finish up on that no i think that's an excellent point to finish on so thank you so much there's been loads of love for this uh, call in the chat so some people off popping off to get childcare and various other things. But thank you so much. That was really good. Oh, we'll get a round of applause for a little. Lovely. Hey. Hey. <laughs>